Mastering Western Blotting Optimization, Expert Tips and Techniques for Better Results. Uh, I would like to start with just short presentation about AgriSierra and where we are located. Uh, well, this is our winter day with beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful northern light and during the summer we have more or less constant light because we are situated quite high up in the north not at the polar circle but uh, close to it and uh, as you can see here it is uh, our locations uh, we have a laboratory located in Umeå where we are doing antibody purification uh, quality control uh, but our antibodies are produced in uh, on a farm located in this uh, beautiful landscape outside Umeå. Uh, company was established quite a long time ago, uh, 1985. We have 55 employees and we have been a par part of Olink Proteomics since uh, year 2020. We are also ISO uh, certified. And uh, our products cover uh, antibodies for plant and algal proteins, as you probably know, but we also have uh, quite a big collection of antibodies to epitope tags, secondary antibodies, and also detection reagents. Uh, in this blue um, uh, strip under on the bottom of each slide, you will find a little bit of information. And uh, as this presentation is going to be shared as PDF, there will be links to specific blog posts, uh, which uh, you can follow uh, afterwards. Western blot uh, is a very exciting technique which aims to visualize and measure specific protein in a complex mix. And please ask yourself a question, how old this technique is? Uh, it has actually been established already in 1979 in two independent uh, laboratories and uh, has been used uh, since that time very effectively. Uh, why Western blot? Why the name Western blot? Uh, as you probably know, we have a southern blot where we work with DNA. We have northern blot for RNA. We have eastern blot for uh, analysis of post-translational modifications and we have Western blot for proteins. And uh, that name actually comes from localization of, um, uh, of the lab, which was uh, first with this technique. They have been located on the West Bank and therefore a Western blot. And the Western blot is based on the concept of a certain uh, sandwich. Just a reminder how a sandwich is looking. Uh, we are having a gel where we electrophoretically separate the protein and these proteins in a complex mixture are uh, migrating in a gel and we need to transfer them effectively to a membrane. This is done in this type of a sandwich where we are applying current and we have a uh, gel and a membrane uh, in the so-called transfer stack and uh, due to electro uh, due to electrical current proteins are migrating from a gel to the membrane and we aim to obtain an exact copy uh, of a gel so what the aim the first aim is to obtain the exact copy uh, uh, of all proteins transferred from the membrane uh, from the gel to the membrane. Who is doing the job of um, visualization of our target protein in a complex mixture? It's of course an antibody. Uh, and just a reminder for you how the antibodies are, uh, these are proteins which are way, way, uh, Y-shaped molecules and they have uh, very different uh, different parts which are important from the point of view of antibody binding. The most important is this part in a, a variable part of the antibody. This part is ending, uh, is uh, changing, and this is where the antigen is binding. And this is so-called FAB region. So this is uh, the part which is changing to accommodate the binding of antibody 
to a target protein or another molecule. But we have also so-called constant region, uh, which is uh, uh, called like that because uh, during research on antibody molecule, this part has crystallized in, uh, in the fridge, and therefore it's called FC fragment, which crystallized. That part is not changing. The most important for antibody binding is uh, antigen binding domain. And this is how a, an antibody looks, which you can find in goat mouse or rabbit serum. Some of you is maybe working with antibodies from llamas. And as you see on uh, this picture, these antibodies are smaller. They have a constant uh, part, but their variable part is much smaller. And this means that they can more easily penetrate, especially in uh, immunolocalization. This can be of an advantage. Antigen binding domain is absolutely crucial to allow uh, the binding of the antibody to the target. Uh, just a short reminder for you, what is an epitope? Because this is where the binding occurs. We have so-called linear epitopes. So if you imagine in a linear structure of the protein, subsequent amino acids uh, are uh, building a so-called linear epitope. And this linear epitope is recognized in um, techniques in denatured conditions, uh, like if we work with Western blood in denatured conditions, immunohistochemistry, where the material is fixed. It means the protein is unfolded, and therefore these linear epitopes are accessible for the antibody. But there are also discontinuous epitopes. And as you see on this picture, uh, the discontinued, ep discontinued epitopes are coming when distant amino acids are brought together by the protein fold. And uh, these discontinuous epitopes, antibodies are binding to in techniques like immunoprecipitation, uh, CHIP, all techniques where we are dealing with a protein which is in its native, non-denatured uh, state. Uh, here is a, a link to the blog post where you can read more. Uh, what is the difference between immunogen, antigen, immunogen and epitope? But I will move on. Please remember, linear epitopes are recognized by antibodies in Western blot technique in the natured conditions. And uh, there is also an important thing I need to mention here about antibody clonality, because uh, which antibodies to use? There's often a dispute. Is a polyclonal antibody worse than a monoclonal? And um, poly means many. So polyclonal antibody will detect a pool of several epitopes. So not only one. And an epitope can consist from 3 to 15 amino acids. So if you think about a polyclonal antibody, you have to think about many specific antibodies binding to your target in different places. And these polyclonal antibodies, in the order of how much of the antibody can we get from the animal, are listed uh, here. They can come from these different species. Monoclonal antibody, on the other hand, hand mono means one. Only one epitope is detected. And monoclonal antibodies can be produced not only in mice, but also in other species. And an epitope is 3 to 15 amino acids, as I mentioned. So uh, if we want to ask a question, which antibody type is better? monoclonal or polyclonal, the answer is that um, monoclonal antibodies are very, uh, they bind to one epitope, so the background signal may be less, but uh, they may only work sometimes in one technique because of that. Because if the epitope is not accessible because of protein fold, the monoclonal antibody may not reach it. Polyclonal antibodies are more versatile because they bind to 
many more epitopes. Uh, so also, if an antibody becomes inactive uh, in a polyclonal antibody, you may observe a gradual deterioration of the antibody, while monoclonal antibody may lose activity overnight. Uh, so it really depends uh, upon the techniques. Monoclonal antibodies are used uh, most commonly in the diagnostic testing, uh, but all in platforms uh, for protein detection are built based on polyclonal antibodies. Antibody choice for you to succeed in the Western blot. Antibody choice must match species and application. And what I have seen over the years is that um, without checking if um, antigen sequence is present in the protein you aim to detect, the antibody is used because it is assumed that the protein is conserved in many different species. Therefore, the antibody must work. I will show you uh, how to determine before you do any purchase, you need to be certain that the sequence to which the antibody is produced is also found in your target protein. Otherwise, the antibody will not work. And also, as you see here, the antibody may must fit also the application. Not all antibodies which work in Western blot will be suitable for immunoprecipitation or immunohistochemistry. And also, remember, the antibodies are validated based on techniques. So the antibody wor must, uh, working in Western blot must be validated in Western blot, but that validation is not worth for immunolocalization. Uh, so before you, you purchase any antibody, you need to really check the conservation level uh, of if, if antigen sequence used to elicit this antibody is also conserved in your target protein. This is a first step to your success. So peptides can, uh, can have quite wide conservation, as I said. Uh, many antibodies which Agricera is producing, actually most of our antibodies are produced to short uh, synthetic peptides between 15 to 30 amino mm -hmm. acids long. And we have produced a pool of so-called global antibodies uh, where uh, one and the same peptide, which was used for immunization, is conserved in all these different species. And these antibodies, most often to photosynthetic proteins, can be used on uh, hundreds of species. But this is not always the case. So, how do I choose the right antibody for my protein? This is the question. Look here. This is an example of photosynthetic protein, PSBA, which is quite conserved uh, uh, through thousands of species. And if we aim to make a peptide antibody, then we may choose a fragment from N-terminal, of course, after signal peptide, not in the signal peptide. It can be a, a peptide located inside the protein, inside the sequence, or it can be C-terminal. And if a protein, if an antibody is produced to a peptide, you need to ask the company if the peptide which was used to produce the antibody is also conserved in your protein. This is what is written on our product information sheets because many antibodies are purchased without that crucial check, which means that uh, published results may not be may, may be actually false positive because you need to start before you use any antibody you receive from a colleague or purchase, you need to be sure that the, the antigen to which the antibody is produced is also found in your protein sequence. This is absolutely crucial. Each year I am actually finding few references with our antibodies uh, where there was no sequence check done and in some cases, the target to which the antibody was made is not even conserved uh, in the protein under investigation. Uh, you need to be really careful because with antibodies, it is quite easy to obtain false positive results. So always, before you even use an antibody, 
you need to check sequence conservation. 70% of sequence and identity is required for antibody to bind. So, for example, here, uh, if this conservation will be covering only these amino acids, such antibody may work. And how the binding of the antibody to the te take the target is um, uh, occurring. So, imagine you have a membrane here with your target protein, and the membrane, of course, as you know, needs to be blocked. And we are incubating a membrane with primary antibody and we have a secondary antibody which creates an enhancement because as you see here, two secondary antibodies are uh, binding or more and they have uh, some kind of label, uh, fluorescent or enzymatic, which will facilit facilitate visualization of a target protein. But there is also another possibility. Uh, we can skip the secondary antibody for proteins of high and medium expression, this method will work very well and will shorten your detection time. Primary antibody needs to be antigen affinity purified and it can be labeled. So this will be shortening your uh, Western blot protocol uh, by some time. This is also one of the possibilities. Western blot protocol has quite many steps. It's quite complex as you know, and you probably um, have been doing quite many Western blots so far, or you are a beginner. And I'm going to walk you through that protocol and show you what can go wrong and what to do. Uh, of course, we are aiming for this nice result in the end. Theory is good, and how about the practice? I will show you now an example of one and the same antibody used in four different uh, laboratories. Ready? It was exactly the same antibody sent to these different labs in different parts of the world. And as you see, the results are very different. One lab didn't get any signal at all. The others got quite a lot of background. And the lab number four was able to actually uh, validate the antibody and obtain a signal in overexpressor and not in the mutants. The protein P4 is not so easy to work with, uh, but as you can see here, um, some optimization of the protocol, the differences between the protocol made actually facilitate the detection. And I will show you what to do to actually uh, succeed with uh, even difficult and proteins of low expression. First thing you need to ask yourself is how much do you know about your protein which you are aiming to detect? What do I mean by that? I mean, we want to facilitate the binding between our antibody and our target. But how much do you know about your target protein? Do you know its biochemical properties? Do you know expression level? Is it high abundancy or low abundancy protein? This is extremely important. Which organ or tissue is it localizing in? I mean, if you take a pin 2, for example, which is expressed in 2 millimeter of the root tip, and you grind the whole root, you're going to dilute your target protein. So you need to really consider organ and tissue localization. You have to also ask yourself, is it localizing in a certain compartment or is it cytoplasmic? There are, how do I know that, you may ask? There are certain databases uh, listed here at the bottom, which can make uh, it possible. So here it is an e-plant database from University of Toronto for all these different species. You can see expression patterns. Of course, these are expression patterns based on mRNA and not whole mRNA may be translated to a protein, but still it will give you an ID. And also you will be able to see, uh, for example, is it senescent leaf, which should be analyzed or is it a seed? I mean, it makes a really huge difference. There is for Arabidopsis, there is a database and also a few more plant species, which I am uh, using very frequently, protein abundance database. And here you will uh, be able to see in the uh, 
PPMs uh, amount of a protein in a specific tissue. We say like this, if an antibody is, if a protein is below 10 PPM, it may be really difficult to detect it. Uh, so this is what we are actually checking before we are producing uh, the antibodies. Protein abundance level in analyzed tissue. Next step after this theoretical analysis is done uh, is, um, of course, sample quality. I would advise for uh, proteins of low expression uh, to use fresh samples. And um, for proteins of high abundance, well, we can be we can allow sample storage, but not longer than few months, really. We have made experiments where we saw degradation of a target protein with prolonged storage. It was a very abundant photosynthetic protein. And of course, it is important how the proteins are um, exp uh, isolated. They need to be of absolutely best quality. Uh, I would recommend if you work with quite many samples, if you need to process like multiple samples, like say 10, 20, bit beater is a very good solution because uh, it will simultaneously ex extract protein uh, from multiple samples. Um, we have also a little bit time consuming methods. Sonication is generating heat. For example, one has to be aware of that. Uh, we have mortar and pestle, which in case of multiple samples can be quite laborious. And you need to really consider that things are happening during protein extraction. So your target protein may get degraded if you pro prolong that time. Uh, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the researchers told me was investigating proteins of uh, circadian rhythm, that he observed certain protein pattern, which he thought was a uh, good ex uh, result, which was generated due to prolonged extraction. So really please keep in mind that protein extraction has to be done really, really uh, quickly. In some cases, protein fractionation may be a solution, if your protein is uh, localizing in certain uh, cellular fraction. Why should we fractionate? You can see it very clearly on this example. Uh, quite many antibodies are probably abandoned uh, if only a total leaf or total root sample is analyzed. Because uh, please see what happens here. No target band, hmm, antibody is not working. But in this case, there was a fractionation series done. And for this target protein, uh, photosystem one uh, sample was giving the best result because target protein became concentrated uh, due to fractionation. As you see also, some background is, for, is um, decreased because of course some proteins are going to be lost during fractionation. You may ask, Okay, my protein is low abundance and is cytoplasmic. What do I do? In this case, uh, you can actually uh, apply um, protein precipitation procedures to concentrate analyzed uh, sample. Protein extraction method and choice of a buffer may actually also matter. Please check on this example. This comes from a test lab which was using different protein extraction buffers. By applying the specific bu buffer, a uh, target protein band has been visualized. Of course, the most commonly used is the buffer based uh, uh, trees, trees buffer, uh, but hippies may in some cases uh, produce better results. Also, for some instances, there is a need to include a denaturing reagent. You can see it here on this example of multi-species blot. Barley, Arabidopsis, rice. Um, band visualized only in Arabidopsis, but on a, a sequence analysis have shown that the peptide used to elicit this antibody is perfectly conserved in all three species. What has been used was that in a second blot, in protein extraction buffer, six molar urea has been applied. 
what is um, Uria doing is that it's unfolding the protein. So if you remember about uh, the fact of accessibility of linear epitopes, the naturing agent will, will unfold the protein, making these epitopes accessible. Hence, visualization of a target band is possible. So in some instances, you need to consider using specific organ. So for example, a two millimeter root tip uh, or senescent leaf. Also, please always include protease inhibitors. And in some cases, proteasome inhibitors are necessary uh, for addition. Uh, there was a lab which was trying to detect a target protein for several months and the blot was blank, like this one, until they realized that the protein they are aiming to detect is also a target of proteosomal degradation. And therefore, uh, addition of proteosome inhibitor was um, protecting the target protein and making it possible to visualize. The next issue, which is very important, how should we work when it comes to Western blood? I wonder if you are aware of uh, this, um, these letters, G, L, P. What do they mean? They actually do not only apply to um, diagnostic or biotech industry. They apply also to us working in the lab with Western blots. Good laboratory practice. What does good laboratory practice mean in reality? We are working clean. You really need to see to it that uh, all vials or all boxes you're incubating, membrane, uh, all equipment is really thoroughly cleaned. We're also working in a cold. This is actually something which uh, what I have learned that uh, some labs are not following it, which can impact uh, their results. We need to be precise and uh, calibrate our pipettes at least once a year. And also we have to have fresh reagent stock. And I know that there are practices of reusing some buffers, but please uh, keep in mind that uh, this may impact your uh, final results. And of course, we need to follow protocol, uh, which uh, will lead to consistency in obtained results. Uh, there is a video uh, available on our website. It is a short video, uh, Western Blood video tutorial, which uh, walks you through um, subsequent steps of the Western Blood. Uh, I built this presentation based on questions. So when we start now with uh, gel electrophoresis, one of the questions was, uh, is it better to use one type of the gel than the other? And here you have an example. Uh, what can be improved in case of usage of trees acetate gels versus trees glycine. There was also a question about why using precast gels. Um, I know many of you probably uh, casting gels yourself and it can work really very well, uh, but using precast gels may help to speed up the process and also um, increase their reproducibility because these gels are casted in uh, controlled uh, industrial uh, environments. We can have different molecular weight range uh, with some gels if we modify a um, running buffer. We have different pH stability and uh, we may have extended shelf life. So these are the advantages of using um, precast uh, gels. So if you are refining your results, this may be uh, one of the steps you uh, can include. What should I load per well? It was another question. As you see here, this is the type of uh, uh, gel system we are using for over 20 years now. These are new page gels from uh, in vitro gen uh, part of Thermo Fisher which allow us to uh, modify, um, depending upon which buffer we are using, we can um, get different separation based on molecular weight of the proteins. And also we can run these gels in native conditions. 
But what should we load per well? Protein, chlorophyll, or volume? Uh, what I would like to recommend is microgram of protein or microgram of chlorophyll. I have learned that quite many labs are using volume, and uh, this is due to uh, that um, it is uh, it's thought that you cannot measure protein concentration uh, in uh, um, in extraction buffer because it contains maybe urea detergents that it's not possible. This is not true because uh, there are reagents like this example, which will allow to measure actually protein concentration in the presence of uh, different compounds. I would like to recommend to uh, make loading based of microgram of protein or microgram of chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll, of course, uh, for photosynthetic uh, uh, samples. Protein load per well. How much material should I have? Is it enough to have nanograms or micrograms? This will also depend what you are um, dealing with. If you have um, recombinant protein, then we are talking about nanograms. If you are dealing with a sample and your target protein is of low abundance, sometimes one needs to load quite a lot of micrograms. It may be up to 100, depending upon what your gel will allow. So here you can see same protein load per well uh, against the um, different primary antibody dilution, how the background signal is then diluted. And here you see an example of titration uh, where varied protein uh, load per well was uh, applied and uh, different primary antibody dilution. And then you finding the point where uh, the background is uh, diluted. Uh, remember that Western blot technique is about finding the most optimal signal to noise ratio. Another question which I have received was about uh, advantages of one dimension or two dimensional uh, gel electrophoresis. Uh, most of the labs are using one dimension. Uh, here you have an example of a one dimensional gel where proteins are separated based on molecular weight and the gel acts as a sieve. If it is of um, if it is a gradient gel, then we will obtain a better separation of uh, high molecular weight proteins, which will get stuck at the top and low molecular weight proteins, which will migrate towards the bottom. If your protein is of low molecular weight, you need to be really careful to uh, optimize your gel electrophoresis so it will not run out of the gel. I have been troubleshooting antibodies where there was no signal, and it was because target protein migrated from the gel. So here we have one dimension which uh, have no uh, uh, isoelectric uh, point limits. It's suitable for membrane proteins also. And here we have a second dimension, so proteins separated in the first dimension are uh, separated um, in a second dimension. You need to remember that each such band will be several prote proteins, and this will be visualized as spots in the uh, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis approach. Uh, which of these to use depends upon which question um, we are asking. Now we are moving to denaturation. Uh, sample denaturation is uh, 90 degrees a golden standard. Well, not. You are probably denaturing your sample in different ways. I collected a few of them. Uh, we are denaturating samples at 70 degrees for five minutes, which is more than enough. Uh, as in the higher temperatures, there is a risk that proteins will aggregate and this will result in a target protein not entering the gel. Uh, this was also one of troubleshootings. Uh, H plus ATPase, which is a membrane protein, is doing exactly that. So in our protocol, it is written the maturation of a sample 70 degrees for five minutes. If somebody is cooking them in higher temperatures, there will be no signal in the Western blot. So actually sample denaturation is a quite important uh, step here. How are we uh, doing protein transfer? 
uh, once the proteins have been separated in a gel, we are transferring them to the membrane. As you remember, we are after obtaining an exact copy of the gel of a, of a gel on the membrane. This is how we do it in our lab. Uh, please remember that uh, it is good to have cold buffers and uh, perform it in an ice bucket if you don't want to do it in a cold room. How important are the conditions of a transfer? Well, they are very important. <laughs> Is it better to run semi-dry transfer in a cold room to avoid overheating? I would say yes. Cold is really good for Western blot. And you can follow this guide. When you're preparing your experiments, please take into account what molecular weight your protein under investigation has. Because as you see here, there is a difference. If we are dealing with protein of low molecular weight, we need to use a membrane with a smaller pore size and different concentration of methanol and uh, SDS, because it's kind of opposite what small molecular weight proteins like compared to high molecular weight proteins. Uh, in, in their case, they love SDS, so more SDS is better. Therefore, wet tank transfer is advised for high molecular weight proteins. And as you see here, also a membrane with a bigger pores. Uh, the, the most common mistake is to run the same protocol in, in irrespect of molecular weight of a target protein. And uh, if you work with proteins of high abundance, this will not be a problem. The problem will come when, when your protein is of low abundance, because this can make actually a big difference if you will be able to detect it or not. Protein transfer, uh, of course, uh, is done in, uh, in, can be done in two different types of membranes. So the question is, which membrane to use? You are probably working with either PVDF or nitrocellulose. In uh, my troubleshooting over the last 20 years, I see that more labs are using PVDF, but it does not mean that this membrane will always give better results. It has uh, binding to proteins is based on hydrophobic interaction. It can be air dried, very big advantage here, and rewetted. I will explain why it is of an advantage. It has better protein retention, physical strength, and chemical compatibility. We have nitrocellulose, which have another uh, mechanism of binding of proteins, and it's more fragile. But some protein antibody pairs will work better on nitrocellulose compared to PVDF. So you need to remember that there are always exceptions, and it's actually good to have both membranes in the lab. Protein transfer type, of course, think about which one you are using. Is it um, wet transfer or semi-dry? And I don't want to, um, to push for one of them if one is better than the other, because I know that in some labs, semi-dry transfer works really well, uh, while in the other labs, it, wet transfer is preferred. We are using wet transfer. Of course, it has um, this advantage that more buffer is needed. Uh, electrode contact is different because it's through the buffer and it's slower. But for some protein antibody pairs, um, it can be better result obtained with one uh, type of transfer than the other. For high molecular weight proteins, wet transfer is recommended. But there are for certain laboratories which are using semi-dry transfer and it works very good for them. Uh, and please remember that if you are a beginner, the wet transfer is less prone to failure. So it may be easier to start with this one. Protein transfer continued. Uh, air bubble removal. Well, we have been doing like that, but we realized that that's not the best method. Best method. Uh, we started to remove air bubbles actually in the cassette. Uh, and um, uh, to obtain sharp ba sharper bands, uh, it's advised not to move around the gel, the whole sandwich. So we are assembling the sandwich in the cassette, okay? And we are very gentle to push any visible air bubbles, absolutely not rolling it flat like that, uh, because moving of a sandwich, 
which can contribute to unsharp bands. And also, uh, you should secure that this sandwich is tightly sitting together because this will also improve uh, the sharpness of, uh, of the bands. When we are doing a protein transfer, uh, we should do a quality control by Ponceau or Comas Air 250, reversible staining. Uh, why, do, why do we do that? When we're setting up a protocol, this is where we are doing it, uh, to save time later. Because if a membrane is looking like this, we will not proceed with a, a next step of a Western blot procedure. And there is another check which we are doing of efficiency of protein transfer. We are doing quality control of a gel by Kumasi. This is very easy, doesn't take long time, and it will show you if your transfer was successful. Here you can see. Uh, we have been using two gels in a cassette, okay? So each gel had its own membrane and we applied electrical current, we did the transfer and then we stained the gels afterwards. And uh, this gel passed, but this did not because as you see, quite many proteins are left behind. Especially if you work with quantification, or with proteins of low expression, this is not really good. So um, for quantification, we advise to, to work with only one, uh, one membrane and um, gel membrane in the sandwich, not two. So after your Western blot is completed, you can easily stain the gel in Kumasi and see if any proteins uh, in the molecular weight, weight range of your target are left. If they are, it means that you need to modify your transfer conditions. Because if not um, all protein is transferred, then it may be contribute to lack of a signal. You need to be certain that your target protein is on a membrane. Exact copy of a gel needs to be on a membrane. And uh, now we're moving towards who is doing the job in Western blot. It's a primary antibody. Uh, Agrisiera primary antibodies are provided lyophilized. This is uh, an advantage for transportation because um, the transportation is uh, lighter. Uh, and also in case the tubes are stuck on customs uh, or something happens, uh, there is no uh, risk of antibody degradation. And also dry ice is quite uh, not environmentally friendly and expensive. So over the last 20 years, this is how we were shipping the antibodies. And these can be either in serum or purified. And antibodies can be purified to total immunoglobulin fraction. Uh, it means that in such preparation, you have all antibodies. Uh, depleted of uh, various serum proteins and fat or antibodies can be antigen purified. So they can be purified using a specific peptide or protein, which were used to elicit given antibody. Please pay attention because some suppliers are selling antibodies in that format, which looks like a lot because it can be 200 or 500 micrograms. Uh, but in the end, <laughs> it will be quite comparable to uh, antigen purified uh, antibodies in, res in respect to how much of specific antibody is in that preparation. You can see it here. We often receive the questions how much uh, of antibody is in serum. Well, this we don't know until purification is done. Uh, usually, 0.5 to 5 percent of uh, antibodies present in serum, total antibody, is your specific antibody to your protein. As stated here, open 5 to 5% 5 of total immunoglobulin will be specific antibody. If uh, a tube contains antigen purified uh, serum, then uh, most of that preparation, it's over 95% purity, is an antibody to the target. How purifications are done? 
uh, they can be also done on a bench if uh, there is no chromatography equipment at hand, but we are using it. Uh, we're doing it using ECTA systems and uh, we are having um, racines where we co uh, couple the antigen, which can be a protein or peptide. We are passing the serum through and antibodies which are not specific to the target are washed away in flow through, while by elution, usually low pH, specific antibodies are uh, eluted and collected. Primary antibody, uh, this is a very exciting question which I have received about the reusing of primary antibody. How long can the same aliquot of antibodies in blocking buffer be reused? How do you think? I know that many of the labs um, are reusing Agricera photosynthetic antibodies because it's actually possible, but sometimes only antibody can be reused one time. Sometimes it can be 20 times. It depends upon the antibody. Uh, please do not assume that it is always possible uh, because sometimes the troubleshooting I get is because the antibody was and there was no signal in the second incubation. Yes, because all of the antibody which was uh, applied on the membrane bound in the first incubation, there's nothing left. So some antibodies cannot be reused. It has to be determined experimentally. And uh, there's also an issue of um, that primary antibodies suddenly may stop working. I know also that this may happen. Agricera collection is also quite long, quite old. It is uh, our antibodies. Some of them are over 20 years old. Uh, and uh, in case of polyclonal antibodies, as I mentioned, you can see gradual deterioration. Monoclonal antibodies may stop working overnight. And what can be the reason? There are several reasons. It can be storage temperature. Um, antibody was, for example, shipped on dry ice. Uh, some antibodies actually may deteriorate because of that. Uh, or uh, there was some contaminants which were leading to its degradation. For example, people were pipetting multiple times from the same vial and there was no uh, antibacterial uh, agent added to the antibody solution. Uh, sometimes lack of stabilizers. But if any stabilizers are necessary, it is uh, specified on Agricera product info sheets. Please do not add glycerol to serum <laughs> because serum itself has a lot of proteins which will protect the antibodies. And as you see here, using the same antibody solution multiple times. So uh, these are the, the parameters which may influence uh, why you may see sometimes uh, that antibody is deteriorating. If you purchased such, uh, purchase an antibody and it starts behaving that way, please report it to uh, a company which supplied you with, uh, with the antibody. Because there is no possibility for us antibody producers to uh, predict how long a given antibody is going to be active. It's, it's impossible because it's uh, influenced uh, these antigen binding domains, their stability may be different, differs between different antibodies because that part is always changing, as you remember. So this may influence the stability of a whole molecule. All right, so now we're coming to unwanted background because you probably experienced it in your work with the uh, with the antibodies and often it is attribu attributed to uh, to an antibody but it's not always the case uh, but in this specific case uh, uh, it was an uh, produced antibody to mitochondrial protein that's a question from another west uh, workshop and as you see here it recognized many other proteins much better even when using purified mitochondria. So in this case, the antibody was weak, having weak affinity to the target. Can I poison this antibody by adding a protein extract from a mutant to it? And is there a rule of thumb of how much of this extract I should add? There is actually a possibility to clean these unwanted cross-reactions 
uh, by depletion. Uh, so how to do it? You prepare a membrane from a mutant which is lacking your target protein, but it is a lot of background on it. Other proteins, you don't want these to be detected. So you prepare such membrane without a target protein. The mutant doesn't have a target protein. And then you, you incubate your primary antibody solution with it. So all these background antibodies will bind to, uh, the, be to the background proteins. And you collect this solution and use it on a regular membrane where you want to uh, detect a target protein. So this is so-called depletion. Such protocol can be also used to remove cross-reactivity from Rubisco. So if you have antibodies in your antibody preparation, you have antibodies which are binding to Rubisco, you can just incubate, separate um, protein sample in a membrane, which contains always usually from leaves quite a lot of Rubisco, incubate your antibody preparation with it, Antibodies which are binding to Rubisco will, will stay on the membrane. You take up this solution and continue with your experiments. So this is a so-called depletion procedure. And we continue with the background. You do, please do not use these tweezers as we did. <laughs> uh, well, uh, is blocking temperature sensitive? Should it be done at four degrees room temperature or in a different temperature? You're probably doing it in different temperatures. Um, usually we recommend one hour room temperature or four degrees of a night. And as you see here, it is protein antibody dependent. I will show you why. This is what we are doing with PVDF membranes. We are preparing membranes in advance with known set of samples, and then we are storing them up to uh, six months, uh, protein side up in a plastic bag, and we are using them later. Also, this step is only possible with PVDF membrane. Please remember, nitrocellulose is too uh, fragile. And what happens when you do like this is also that proteins will unfold further because of uh, being air dried. Membrane is air dried and this can lead to further protein denaturation. So good from a point of view of detection of linear epitopes. And here you can see examples of uh, different uh, temperature uh, applied uh, for blocking. Uh, in this first experiment, a blocking was done, as you see here, 30 minutes room temperature, 1% milk, a lab returns this result and says the antibody is worthless. Okay, I say incubate longer with increase the milk and incubate for one hour at room temperature and you see what happens. So it's not always the antibody which is bad. You need to find the optimal conditions for obtaining the optimal signal to noise ratio. For the other antibody protein pair, incubation overnight was necessary. And then you probably wonder which blocking reagents uh, we can use. As I see with plant samples, uh, I see the best results with 5 to 10 percent non-fat non -fat milk. Of course, in some cases, uh, there can be an effect of overblocking, but it is rather rare. So if, uh, if you block too short, you can end up with a result like this. Of course, uh, assuming that the target protein band is already visible on your uh, blood. There are also a range of commercial blockers, which uh, are very effective. If someone needs non-protein blocker, it can be used for PVP40, which is used for frac in fractionation, can be used as a blocker, actually. This is um, a tip which I received from one laboratory in Germany. BSA is least effective. I know some labs are mixing BSA and non-fat milk. Therefore, for me, BSA is uh, at the bottom of the list. For, uh, before it is gelatin is the most messy, actually. So I would stick to 5 to 10% non-fat milk. Of course, there can be exceptions, and some 
protein antibody pair may, may work better with uh, another blocker. But this is what I have seen over the years. My, uh, this is also what we are using. 5 to 10 percent not fat, non-fat milk. Antibody titration for the best signal to noise ratio. When you are refining your results for publication, you can attempt to play a little bit with uh, combining protein load per well with antibody dilution. And then you can see that, uh, of course, the background bound, uh, bands are going to be uh, diluted. They can also be blocked away by increasing a blocker concentration, as you saw in the previous slide. I, uh, we are, of course, after this effective binding of our primary antibody to a target, but sometimes uh, you are using a stripping process and reprobing of the same membrane. And I received a question, how to reduce the background signals while stripping and reprobing? And one would should ask a question why the background signal may increase, because you're breaking this uh, antibody protein uh, and by stripping, you can also strip some of the target from a membrane. So please remember about that. And this can okay. contribute to increased background. Right uh, comparing primary antibodies, does it work? This is also what uh, I have experienced that uh, people saying actin works very well, but uh, I am using another antibody and it doesn't work. Why is that? And act you have to keep in mind that actin is highly abundant protein and you cannot compare an antibody to a protein which is of high abundance with an antibody to a protein of low expression. It, it does not wor work that way. This comparison cannot be done. Actin may uh, be a good loading control, but this is, um, this is about that. <laughs> and also, if, for example, your protein is of very low molecular weight, the reason why you get signal from actin, but not from your target, can be that it was blasted through the membrane. You used uh, wrong uh, blotting conditions. So again, if something doesn't work, do not repeat another blot. Go back to the desk and do theoretical analysis. It will save you a lot of time. Uh, an in antibody incubation buffer can also change the pattern which you may observe. Look here. Uh, for this protein antibody pair, PBST buffer resulted in uh, decreased background. But you need to keep in mind that PBST buffer is not suitable when you're working with phospho-specific antibodies. And now we are coming to the exciting part of saving time. How can we save time with Western blot? And uh, here it is a first example, parallel incubation. I wonder how many of you have been doing it. Uh, it is uh, possible. And uh, this was one of the labs which were using our antibodies. They sent us this result. Uh, as you see here, target proteins have to be apart for at least 20, 30 kilodaltons, and you need to work with well-characterized antibodies. But if you have some precious samples, then instead of doing three blots, you can just uh, do one with different antibodies which uh, you are working with. And then the second uh, uh, possibility to save time is the parallel incubation of all everything at once. So we have uh, primary, secondary antibodies and a blocker in one mix. It sounds hilarious <laughs> or rebellious, but it's possible. Uh, it is uh, advised for antibodies which you characterize, which you know how do they behave. So that way you can shorten your Western blot time to only one hour, I mean, to be conducted within one hour because you will cut off all, uh, all these few hours of incubations, washes, and so on and so forth. 
So that's the second way to save time. And when, now we come to a third possibility where you are using a primary antibody, which is directly conjugated with an enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, horseradish peroxidase, or for example, a fluorescent dye. And this will also cut off uh, further steps of incubations with secondary antibody and washes. This uh, approach uh, is advised for proteins of moderate and high expression. So these were the ways of uh, saving time. And now we are coming to the moving forward in our Western blood procedure. We are coming to secondary antibodies, which are also an important part of facilitating the detection. So there is a lot of uh, secondary antibodies available, depending what was the host uh, where the primary antibody was uh, produced. And, and uh, you may sometimes feel overwhelmed because uh, there are all different formats of these secondary antibodies. Some are offered as uh, just FAB. So it is an antibody which where this FC region is cut off. And uh, uh, these are not necessary to use for a simple Western blot. Uh, so I would like to guide you now how to choose a secondary antibody. Let's say that we have a primary antibody made in a rabbit. So of course, a secondary has to be anti-rabbit and it is uh, having a certain label. So enzyme or a fluorophore. And you may say, okay, secondary antibody, who cares from where is it coming? And actually secondary antibodies may be uh, different in terms of different parameters. You would like to have uh, been using secondary antibodies with as high dilution as possible because it means that one milligram of a, such secondary antibody will last for whole your PhD. Uh, so it is actually a difference uh, when purchasing secondary antibodies, uh, one usually concentrates on how much is in the vial, but one milligram with a dilution one to 25,000 as this antibody can be used in much more experiments compared to the antibody of lower dilution. And please remember, do not incubate longer than one hour at room temperature. Uh, once I am, am was troubleshooting a blot which was um, conducted in three days, which is absolutely not necessary. For secondary antibodies, one hour room temperature uh, is an, well than enough. Please keep this in mind. And now, how to choose a secondary antibody for a Western blot? So, which one would you choose? We have a goat antirabbit heavy and light chains conjugated with enzyme horseradish peroxidase or the antibody which was adsorbed through all these different through columns with uh, bovine human goat mouse rat agg uh, the answer is coming now of course the first one will do well in the western blood the second one uh, will be more suitable for, for example, immunolocalization on this material. So uh, plant people do not need to bother about, uh, about this for Western blood purpose. But why do I bring here an adsorbed secondary antibody? Such antibodies are valuable when you would like to minimize cross reactions in other uh, techniques. And now we are uh, moving towards the end of the Western blood protocol. So we are moving towards detection and how it is done. Uh, my favorite detection and one which is still most frequently used is chemiluminescent detection. So we have an enzyme, secondary antibodies conjugated with an enzyme, horseradish peroxidase, and we have a CCD camera, which is necessary to facil facilitate the detection. And uh, well, here the fault, which is quite often used, is that people are using uh, too sensitive ECL uh, 
and therefore a lot of background comes up. If you're dealing with a highly abundant photosynthetic protein or another highly abundant protein, then the ECL with the mid femtogram detection range is enough, like Agricera ECL Bright. So if you are using too sensitive ECL, this will result in, of course, a lot of background coming up. Advantages of chemiluminescence is sensitivity and quantification also. Um, this advantage is that we need to record the signal immediately. It's suitable for quantification and uh, analysis of proteins present in low levels. It's a very useful uh, technique. And what to do if something goes wrong? Here, uh, ghost bands, uh, maybe some of us or of you have seen them. And what do they come from? Uh, they come from an excess. It's too much of everything. So the reaction is going too fast. And therefore, this uh, white uh, bands instead of uh, black bands and also an antibody mismatch can be a reason for it. What to do if, uh, if something goes wrong? We want the blood like this, but uh, it became too much. It's a lot of background. What should I do? Can I redo the same primary and secondary antibodies without this, uh, the stripping? And yes, within the same day, you can actually develop the blood, uh, wash it and develop it with, for example, ECL of lower sensitivity. Uh, Agricera provides an ECL as a pack of two reagents. So you already have one which is very sensitive and one which is of medium uh, sensitivity. So if something goes wrong, you can just wash the membrane and develop it with another ECL and save it uh, and save your experiment. And here is an exciting uh, question. Epitope tag antibody and there is no signal. I received this question yesterday. And what shall we do? This is actually quite common. Uh, we have used the... Uh, a GFP antibody on another protein expressed in our lab, and it does not work. Why? It works on protein A, it does not work on protein B. And here are some suggestions what to do. Uh, first of all, expression level of tagged protein. Maybe it's, it's too low. Maybe it's not expressed at all. In this case, you can increase protein load per well. Use uh, the naturant to further unfold the recombinant proteins, because believe me, even in the natured conditions of Western blots, some proteins can actually fold back. So you need to keep them unfolded. You can also, if you use PVDF membrane, you can dry it in the air, protein side up, and therefore unfold your target protein. If above does not work, unfortunately, you need to try another GFP antibody. It is uh, common that there is a problem with antibodies to epitope tags and actually it's not a problem maybe with antibodies in itself but the way uh, that recombinant proteins maybe are refolding and hiding the epitope an antibody is binding to so therefore please keep in mind to keep your protein uh, unfolded of course, sometimes can happen that an antibody may recognize better a native protein. And therefore, if you, <laughs> in, it may not work well in the Western blood of uh, in the natured conditions, but these are much rare cases. And now we are moving on to fluorescent detection. Some of you maybe is using that one. As you see here, it is uh, two different target proteins are detected on the same uh, experiment uh, with uh, different secondary antibodies conjugated with dyes of uh, different uh, wavelength. Uh, this is quite useful technique. Of course, digital camera is necessary to record the, the signal. Uh, signal is present for months. So this is a big advantage over ECL detection and it allows also multiplexing as shown in, on this picture. A disadvantage is uh, dedicated equipment which is needed and also lower sensitivity compared to chemiluminescence. 
This is suitable for uh, quantification and multiplexing. And now we are coming to colorimetric detection. If there is no digital camera at hand, we can actually use um, uh, and uh, this system, uh, TMB based and an enzyme alkaline phosphatase, uh, which will visualize the bands directly on the membrane. So you can actually use uh, this membrane um, and uh, put it in your lab book. However, <clears throat> the bands are going to fade, so it's good to record them in time. Advantage is that this method is inexpensive and fast. However, it is not suitable for quantification. And also, you need to keep in mind that sensitivity here is low. So I wouldn't um, advance to detect uh, using a colorimetric detection method uh, proteins of very low expression level. It will not work. <clears throat> Uh, it is, however, suitable for quick assessment. So if we just want to have yes and no answer, protein is highly abundant, then it is a quite good method to use. But please remember, no buffers containing PBS can be used with, uh, with this method. So detection produces as final results, which hopefully are really good. We can use either chemi or fluorescence, or we can use chromogenic detection. Uh, they have different sensitivity uh, levels, and please keep that in mind. How to determine molecular weight of a target protein detected on the Western blot? Uh, the reason I bring up this, this question is that uh, um, I've been uh, troubleshooting results uh, which were coming due to wrongly assigned molecular weight. The membrane was turned upside down. <laughs> and therefore, I would suggest that you can mix so-called colored markers. This is what we do. Uh, you mix them with uh, tagged markers. So you can, use, uh, uh, you can use a mixture, which will allow you to visualize the protein during the uh, electrophoresis, and then later when you are <clears throat> visualizing the plot because the markers have IgG binding site and they are su suitable for uh, all these different uh, detection methods. So this will allow a very easy determination if we're dealing with a, a target protein. Is it detected? Does it have a correct molecular weight? This is actually pretty crucial. And now, how to get an intense signal from Western blood using a weak antibody? Well, I would like to turn around this question and send you back to the desk and do theoretical analysis. Is an antibody really weak or is there somewhere else in the procedure where improvement is necessary? So you need to consider, am I using right sample type? Should I maybe use two millimeter of a root tip, not a whole root? Should I do fractionation? Is my protein localizing in nuclei? Is low abundancy? I will not detect it in a total cell extract. Maybe protein load per well has to be increased. Do I have optimal transfer conditions? Do you remember there are different transfer conditions depending upon molecular weight of a protein? Do I use antigen purified antibodies? So all this do I have appropriate detection reagent? Maybe I use chromogenic detection for low abundance protein. It is not going to work. So all this all in all is an optimization. Of course, there are also antibodies of uh, low quality, which will not bind so well to the target protein. But before you discard an antibody, please do this analysis and ask yourself questions uh, if there is any step which needs to be improved. I would like to show you an example before and after optimization. So you see here, oh, bad antibody, a lot of background. This is the same antibody. What has been changed? Look here, protein load per well. This is the only thing which was changed in this setup. This antibody is so good that uh, the incubation can actually be done not overnight, but uh, in this experiment, it has been done uh, overnight. 
So it can be as small detail as how much protein we are loading per well, which can contribute to the increased background or to short, blo to short blocking time or to low blocker concentration. Uh, I have an advice for beginners. Record a correct band first before multiplying variations of conditions. This is a mistake which I have seen, which is most commonly uh, done. Uh, a lab contacts me after they have been doing 10 or 20 blots. You need to do, if, if things do not work, you need to do theoretical analysis. Do not repeat just blot after blot. And here, uh, when we are uh, working with antibodies which are not characterized, these are the conditions which we are using. So always try to have specific mutant. Uh, if it is not possible, maybe use a condition which is enhancing your target protein. As you see here, load per, per well quite high. Uh, incubation of primary antibody overnight. I'm talking here about an antibody which has never been used before, which is newly produced. And then we hope that the result looks like that. Target band needs to be gone in a mutant sample. This is an absolute must for properly validated antibody. And then uh, we have an advice for both experienced users. So you see, this is how it looks before optimization and after optimization. And dear experienced users, please do not use the same protocol on all antibodies because that's also the most common mistake. One applies the protocol which has been used in a lab for last five years, but the protein maybe requires modification of transfer conditions or extraction protocol is not good enough. So all this has to be uh, taken into account. And of course, you are always welcome to send us uh, your blots. We're really keen to help you, even if you're working with an antibody which was not produced by us, it does not matter. Uh, I will be happy to help. And if you have still such blots, this is from my bad blot collection, uh, then you are always welcome to, uh, to contact us. And now time for a little brain, um, <laughs> brain gymnastics common misconceptions about the antibodies, true or false. Other antibodies I have bought from AgriSierra work. Therefore, this one should work too. Answer yourself, true or false? Actually, false. Because that the one antibody works does not mean anything because the antibodies are made to different proteins. Each protein antibody pair has its own characteristics, which are absolutely unique. The antibody works for species A, so for sure it's going to work for species B. That's actually also false. It does not confirm anything uh, because, as you saw, the antibody can be made to a short peptide. And even if the overall sequence conservation is high, but uh, the peptide which was chosen may lay be, uh, be, be outside it, maybe used not from that part. So you need to always start with sequence check. The same protocol can be applied for all antibodies. I think you know the answer. And antibody gives a good signal in Western blood, so therefore it should also work in other techniques. True or false? False. Remember, one technique, one validation. So it does not say anything. If antibody fails in Western blot, it still can be useful for some other technique. So do not give up too soon. And uh, if you have problems, I would like to welcome you to come to our technical blog where we are posting different information. Uh, this presentation contains also links to uh, various blog posts and uh, if you are interested to receive this presentation, uh, please let me know. I will show how.
<laughs> and here comes also a very important point, which I would like to share with you. How to cite an antibody and why is it important? Actually, uh, more than a half of antibodies used in research cannot be properly identified, and this is due to lack of product number. Because it's not enough to say that the antibody is Rubisco from Agricera because we have 10 antibodies to Rubisco. So which antibody has been used is really crucial. Unfortunately, there is no worldwide standard for this, uh, but uh, this makes it really difficult for people who would like to repeat the experiment. So please keep this in mind and uh, add the product number. This is not an advertising for supplier. This is providing a, a solid uh, information which will allow another researcher to repeat the results. And also would be nice to have these details. As you saw, it may be important what protein load per well, what primary antibody dilution have been used. It's, it's oftentimes a very little information about it. But if antibody is purchased from a, a company, this information should be included on product information sheet. However, laboratories, of course, modify it uh, as uh, they are doing their own setups. But please remember antibody name, product number and supplier, and that way we can help to increase reproducibility. I would like to, um, to encourage you also to use Agricera free resources. We have these uh, beautiful educational posters, which are um, which are done together with uh, scientific uh, laboratories worldwide. They are about photosynthesis, epigenetics. This year there will be a poster about protein extraction, so something which may be of interest for you. Uh, and uh, images from these posters are also available for free download on our website. And I would like to also encourage you to use Global Plant Science Events Calendar, which is created together with American Society of Plant Biology. And the calendar has been celebrated, I think it's five years this year. Uh, you will find there all different information, workshops, conferences, online events, uh, events for free, conferences. It's uh, over 200 events dedicated for plant science, which you will find there. If you would like to be informed about uh, our promotions and about news about antibodies, technicals, tips, uh, then of course newsletter is a, a good source of it. But uh, I think at least half of you knew about this workshop from our newsletter, so that confirms that it can be useful. Uh, and also um, free antibodies. We have over 100 free antibodies, which are added New antibodies are added each week. There is no limit of how many antibodies you can get uh, if experimental setup fits. So uh, <clears throat> you're welcome to take uh, a look at the list and uh, let me know if there is any antibody which would be helpful for you, which you would like to receive. Uh, for product inquiries from India, uh, please contact Biotechnolabs and for attendees from other countries uh, uh, who would like to receive certificate uh, and recording of the workshop, please send an email directly to me. We have been communicating uh, about that workshop, so you can just respond to that and you will receive the slides and uh, the recording as well. So thank you very much.